plunging into the frigid waters south of Iceland on the hunt to intercept Allied convoy HX-1145, the crew of U-570, helmed by Captain Lieutenant Hans Joachim Ramlow, found themselves caught in a living nightmare. The German sailors faced a barrage of malfunctions, poorly calibrated diesel engines that sent shutters through the sub's steel spine, a broken air compressor that suffused their cramped quarters with fetid air, and dead hydrophones that left them as good as blind in the abyssal depths. These hurdles might have been mere bumps in the road for a seasoned U-boat crew, but Romlo and his inexperienced crew, embarking on their maiden patrol, found themselves drowning in unfamiliar waters. Seasickness and plummeting morale laid waste to the crew. The sub's narrow corridors bore witness to their misery. Yet, driven by the crushing weight of their mission, they pressed on. German intelligence had spared no effort to chart the course of convoy HX-1145, charging them with its destruction. They were determined not to fail their country. But Romlo and his ailing crew had been deceived. There was no convoy HX-1145. It was a ruse concocted by Allied intelligence to draw an unsuspecting U-boat into Icelandic waters for capture. Little did the beleaguered German crew know the worst part of their ordeal was yet to come. Despite the horrifying conditions faced by U-570 and her crew as they darted toward Iceland, they were confident in their ability to bring down the Allied convoy without too much trouble. After all, by 1941, German U-boats had earned their reputation as the Atlantic's predators, sinking Allied vessels with a ferocity that sent shockwaves through the seas. These underwater marauders had obliterated hundreds of thousands of tons of Allied shipping, rendering the British countermeasures almost futile. The notion that the Allies might attempt to capture a U-boat straight from the jaws of the Kriegsmarine seemed like a pipe dream. It was a gamble of the highest order. German commanders were drilled with one principle, never let your submarine fall into Allied hands. The stakes were monumental. Faced with the looming threat of capture, U-boat crews were ordered to scuttle their ships, a desperate measure to sink their own vessel and keep its secrets submerged. This directive safeguarded the cutting-edge technology aboard these steel sharks. From the Enigma machines that scrambled their communications to the advanced torpedo systems, these innovations were light years ahead of the Allies and key to the U-boat's reign of terror on the high seas. This made capturing an intact U-boat an extremely rare and difficult occurrence. Yet, on August 27, 1941, due to a stroke of misfortune that haunted Romlo and his crew, the Allies were handed a golden opportunity on a silver platter. Pushed to the brink by the suffocating grip of their submarine's interior, the German crew found themselves in a dire predicament about 80 miles south of Iceland. A mishap forced them to break the surface, a decision encapsulated by Romlo's urgent commands, quote, flood reserve ballast, planes hard to dive. He swiftly took the helm from Oberlieutenant Bernard Bent, who was overwhelmed by the emergency. Unbeknownst to them, their radarless state left them blind to the imminent danger. U-570 was on a collision course with destiny, surfacing right under the nose of a lurking bomber. As soon as U-570's crew realized they had surfaced just below an enemy plane, they dove back into the embrace of the Atlantic. The British warplane immediately prepared to sink the submarine right there and then. However, fate intervened, and the charges stubbornly clung to the bay, refusing to deploy. Instead, the aircraft unleashed smoke markers and dispatched a sighting report back to base. This breadcrumb trail led another Hudson, mere hours later, to stumble upon the U-boat as she surfaced once more, almost as if beckoning the aircraft from directly beneath. Romlo's judgment, perhaps clouded by the harrowing conditions endured by his crew, faltered when he neglected to scour the skies with his air periscope before ordering a second surfacing. This lapse in vigilance left U-570 vulnerable, as squadron leader J. Thompson's aircraft swiftly encircled the submarine, unleashing a barrage of depth charges that effectively trapped it in place. The brain-numbing shockwaves of the quadruple underwater explosions rolled the U-boat onto her beam ends. Inside the U-boat, chaos reigned. Lights flickered out, instruments shattered, and seawater invaded the forward compartments. The destruction of some batteries sparked a frenzy among the crew as the imminent threat of chlorine gas poisoning loomed large, a silent killer within the steel confines of their underwater fortress. In the words of the U-boat captain, quote, We dropped lower. How low, we did not know, as our instruments were no longer functioning. We only knew sooner or later the point would be reached where the surrounding water pressure would crush the boat. In that situation, 
The only course was to blow out the ballast tanks immediately with compressed air. Refusing to leap into the icy embrace of the North Atlantic, and under a hail of bullets from the Hudson that had initially engaged them, U-570's crew signaled their surrender, brandishing white shirts and makeshift flags as symbols of their capitulation. The Hudson's pilot, recognizing the gesture, halted his assault and called for backup, summoning another Hudson armed to the teeth with depth charges and a consolidated Catalina from the 209th Squadron, fresh from sinking U-452 just two days prior. In a desperate bid for rescue, U-570's skipper broadcast an unencrypted distress signal and ordered the jettison of the submarine's most guarded secrets, including the Enigma Code machine, into the unforgiving sea. The Allied activity in the area was so massive that no U-boat dared to make a move, despite arriving near the scene. As the sun dipped toward the horizon around 10 p.m., an armed trawler steered through the waters to claim this unexpected bounty. Despite a rogue attack the following morning by a Northrop N3PB floatplane, manned by Norwegian forces unaware of the U-boat surrender, the British successfully escorted U-570 to the safety of Reykjavik. While the secret documents and the Enigma machine were lost to the depths, the capture of U-570 opened a treasure trove of intelligence on the Type 7 submarine. The loss of the Enigma machine was not as crippling as it might have been. Britain had previously secured one from U-110, ensnared by surface warships. The crew of U-570, now prisoners of war, found their way to Grisdale Hall in England. Their immediate ordeal at sea had ended, yet a new challenge loomed on the horizon. They would soon face the wrath, not of their captors, but of their own countrymen, a daunting prospect in its own right. Nestled in the picturesque Lake District of northwestern England, Grisdell Hall earned its stripes as Britain's foremost prisoner of war camp, designated as Number One. This was the holding ground for the elite naval officers of Germany's Kriegsmarine. News of U-570's capture sent shockwaves through the camp, leaving the POWs aghast as they poured over British newspaper accounts. Among them, Sergeant Officer Captain Otto Kretschmer stood out, seething with disdain. Kretschmer, a titan of the U-boat fleet, had sent over 260,000 tons of Allied shipping to the ocean's depths. His capture followed the demise of U-99 on March 17, 1941, a day that marked the end of his reign on the high seas. He vehemently criticized what he saw as a cowardly surrender by U-570's commander. In response, the German officers at Grisdell Hall took matters into their own hands, setting up a makeshift court-martial for U-570's crew upon arrival. This tribunal was to be a three-man panel led by Captain Lieutenant Horst Hesselbarth, who, aside from his naval career, was skilled in the law. This German council was determined to ensure the proceedings stuck rigidly to the letter of German military law, upholding their own standards of justice within the walls of their British captivity. The German officers imprisoned at Grisdale Hall felt a deep-seated obligation to hold a trial, despite their status as prisoners of war on foreign soil. In 1941, fueled by sweeping European successes, they harbored a steadfast belief that victory over Great Britain was not just possible, but inevitable. This conviction underscored their decision to proceed with the trial, anticipating its relevance in a future where they envisaged German rule extending to British shores. Clearly, such a tribunal flouted the conventions of English law, lacking any legal foothold in the host country. Yet undeterred, the German officers pressed on with their three-man panel to adjudicate the case, involving not just Romlo, but three additional figures, Lieutenant Bernhard Berndt, Lieutenant Zerze Walter Christensen, and Engineer Eric Menzel. Commander Romlo, central to the controversy, was absent and detained for interrogation in London, leaving his subordinates to face the makeshift court first. Christensen and Menzel were swiftly exonerated, deemed non-complicit in the critical decisions aboard U-570. The spotlight then turned to Bernhard Berndt. The proceedings unveiled a tense and probing dialogue between Horst Hesselbarth, the tribunal's chairman, and Berndt. The exchange highlighted Berndt's familiarity with the U-boat code of conduct emphasizing the paramount rule against allowing a U-boat to be captured. Despite acknowledging this, Berndt admitted no efforts were made to scuttle U-570 at the directive of Captain Hans Joachim Romlo. Hesselbart's interrogation pointedly questioned why Berndt did not seize command under the dire circumstances, a suggestion that, while theoretically valid, ignored the practical impossibilities given the crew's inexperienced and beleaguered state. The inquiry further determined that U-570 was fully operational and could have evaded capture, shifting the blame increasingly toward Berndt for the perceived dereliction of duty, despite the evident constraints. 
The session underscored the grim reality of Bernd's predicament, and snared in a web of accountability for actions largely governed by his superior's directives. With Romlo absent and Bernd bearing the brunt, the tribunal seemed poised to convict him of cowardice. This verdict would deliver the capital sentence. The situation escalated when the POWs learned that the Royal Navy had docked U-570 at Barrow in Furness in Cumbria, Northern England, a stone's throw from Grisdale Hall, nearly 25 miles away. The officers then proposed a daring plan to Lieutenant Bernhard Bert, infiltrate where the submarine was birthed and sabotage it, a move that would both hinder British efforts and potentially restore his tarnished honor as a German naval officer. Rumors even circulated that Bernd proposed this audacious plan to redeem his reputation after the trial had placed most of the burden over his shoulders. In a display of remarkable ingenuity, Bernhard Bernd was disguised as a Dutch merchant seaman, a cover that would explain his heavily accented English. Should he be apprehended, his concocted backstory was that after a night of heavy drinking in Blackpool, he mistakenly wandered off course while trying to return to his ship in Liverpool. Under the guise of a raucous sing-along party held by the Germans, Berndt slipped away into the night through an opening in the barbed wire, embarking on his mission. The plan initially unfolded without a hitch, allowing Berndt to cover two miles undetected. However, his freedom was short-lived when a British civilian home guard patrol intercepted him. Berndt's cover story and forged documents momentarily convinced the patrol, who decided to escort him to Grisdale Hall for further verification, which was routine at the time, especially in the surroundings of a major POW prison camp. Realizing the peril of his situation, Berndt attempted to flee, prompting a chase that ended tragically with a single bullet. Previously branded a coward, Lieutenant Bernhard Berndt met his end far from cowardice, ironically earning him posthumous recognition as a hero. Reeling with the sudden loss of Berndt, Otto Kretschmer was consumed with a desire to right the wrong to the Council of Honor's hasty judgment. In a bold move, he approached the camp's leader, Major Veach of the Coldstream Guards, pleading for a farewell befitting a warrior for the fallen Oberlieutenant. Veach, moved by the gesture, granted Kretschmer's request, allowing Berndt to be laid to rest with the dignity of full military honors. Even more ironically, Commander Hans Joachim Romlo arrived at Grisdale Hall on the day of Berndt's funeral. By this time, British authorities had forbidden any further tribunals among the German POWs, sparing Romlo from facing a similar inquisition as Berndt. Romlo's past, which included a six-month stint in a military mental hospital in 1939 before his commission as a U-boat commander, perhaps sheds light on his swift surrender of U-570 under duress. Berndt's chapter might have closed with his untimely demise, but his U-boat story was far from over. Now flying under a new flag, the vessel embarked on a fresh chapter as HMS Graf, seamlessly melded into the British fleet. Assigned to the third submarine flotilla and placed under the command of Captain Peter Marriott, Graf was repurposed for the cutting edge of experimental naval warfare. Despite the tight squeeze inside, the Graf turned out to be a goldmine of technical treasures for the British, especially with its steel hide, 20.5 millimeters thick, a bulwark against the crushing embrace of the deep. Graf's maiden voyage under the Union Jack kicked off on October 8, 1942, marking almost a year since she was commissioned into British service. It was during this patrol that Graf locked horns with U-333 off the North Spanish coast. Despite unleashing a quartet of torpedoes at U-333, Graf's prey slipped through the net, dodging all attacks. Captain Marriott, convinced by the echo of explosions that U-333 had been destroyed, was unaware that his adversary, commanded by Peter Kremer, had lived to tell the tale. It wasn't until 1980, when Kremer stumbled upon Marriott's wartime logs, that he pieced together the identity of his attacker as Graf, once his fleetmate U-570, and sibling to his own U-333.